Good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. At the outset, I'll ask everyone to switch off their electronic devices or switch them to silent mode so that they do not affect the committee's work. We have apologies today from Jenny Mara, our convener, and I would like to welcome David Stewart, who is substituting for Jenny. Good morning. Uh, at the outset, then, I'd like to invite David Stewart to declare any relevant interests. Thank you, convener. I have no relevant interest to declare. Thank you. Uh, item two on our agenda is for the committee. Do the members agree to take items five and six on the agenda in private? Yep. Thank you. Uh, item three on the agenda is the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service update a report from the Auditor General. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today. Uh, first of all, Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General for Scotland. Mark Roberts, Senior Manager at Audit Scotland, and Catherine Sibold, Audit Manager from Audit Scotland. Uh, good morning. Uh, at the outset, then, may I invite the Auditor General to make a short opening statement? Thank you, Convener. Today's report is a follow-up to work that we published back in May 2015. We've looked again at the progress that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has made since its establishment in 2013. In our last report, we commented positively on how the merger of the eight former regional fire and rescue services had been managed. In this report, we go on to examine the progress that's been made since then in integrating the service into a genuinely national organisation and transforming itself to respond to the changing risks facing people across Scotland. Overall, we found that progress has been steady but slow. The service has taken a cautious approach to transformation over the last five years, seeking to secure public, political, staff and union support for its vision, and that's taken time. The main union for whole-time firefighters, the Fire Brigades Union, operates and negotiates at a UK level, while fire and rescue services are a devolved matter. In addition, finance has been a limiting factor. It was only at the end of last year that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service felt that it was in a financial position to move ahead with its plans for transformation, given additional funding from the Scottish Government as part of the draft 2018-19 budget and the Treasury's decision in November 2017 to end the Fire and Rescue Service's VAT liability. Other challenges do remain. First of all, the retained duty system that the Fire and Rescue Service op operates in many parts of Scotland is under pressure, as it is in many other countries. And secondly, the service inherited a significant and we think insurmountable backlog of £389 million in the capital investment required to bring its estate, its fleet and its equipment up to acceptable standards. To put that in context, the service's capital budget for 2018-19 is £32.5 million. Finally, convener, members know that I place considerable importance on public bodies understanding their financial sustainability and developing long-term financial strategies. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service responded positively to this recommendation in our May 2015 report, and the work the service has done since then has placed it in a much stronger position to move ahead with its strategy and its transformation plans. Convener, as always, the team and I are happy to answer the committee's questions. Thank you, Auditor General. Uh, I would like to start. Uh, the, on, on certainly a very positive note, it seems to me, the key message too uh, on your report talks about how the board continues to work well uh, and talks about it having real strengths in the quality of discussion and scrutiny and challenge of management. Now, that contrasts somewhat with uh, a number of inquiries that this committee has done uh, down the last few years, uh, where we've looked at governance failures in other bodies which have had uh, significant issues for whichever the audited body is. So this is really refreshing uh, to see this positive message on the SF SRFS board. Uh, so can you tell us, from your perspective, what is it that's making this board different from the other boards and what qualities do they have? I'll ask Mark in a moment to talk you through some of the specific uh, features of this board that we think have led to our positive uh, conclusion on their effectiveness. Um, it's probably also worth me um, setting in context that many of the issues that come before this committee um, are here because something has gone wrong. Um, so the examples that the committee sees aren't necessarily representative of the way that boards operate across the public sector. Um, and I absolutely recognise the importance that this committee places on good board working. So I'll ask Mark to give you what insights he can from the work the team have done with them. 
Thank you. We, we said in our previous report um, back in May 2015 that the board was start, starting to perform well, and I think what we've seen is a continuation of that, that process e ever since. Um, the board has had a, a relatively high degree of stability in terms of its membership, which I think has helped, and I think within the board there's um, a real culture of kind of self-reflection and self-evaluation in terms of, of how do we make this work work well, which is very, very positive. The the, the history has, has been, um, I think, in the early stages of the fire and rescue services, um, it was a big shift from moving from the local government environment into the central government environment. And I think the management of the organisation did take a little time to adapt to that, that the new level and intensity of scrutiny that was going on. But that has now become a very, very um, positive relationship. Um, not not in an over, over too close relationship at all, but one where the kind of um, interests of the service are, are shared very much between the board and, and the senior management, and there's, there is genuine real challenge and discussion and debate at the, the appropriately strategic level. Um, and as the Auditor General said, it, it's, it's an organisation that we think quite highly of in terms of how its board works. Very good, thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Auditor uh, General, um, this report actually waxes quite lyrical for, for once, so it's very very nice to see a, a positive response on it. One of the things that does pop out, though, of course, is the backlog on maintenance. And, uh, you know, a comment you make here in paragraph 53 is that there is a... This is a, this is a, as a result of legacy from the previous eight fire services. How much of it is... That backlog is legacy, and how much has arisen since? I think it's very difficult to break it down in quite that way. Um, we do know from the work we've done on fire and rescue services over a number of years, back in 2015, but also on the eight former legacy services, um, that uh, there was already a, a backlog of capital required um, and a risk that in the run-up to the merger um, for local authorities funding um, the former rescue services, investing in assets for the long term was less of a priority than it otherwise would have been. So we think the backlog built up further then. Um, but it's not possible to draw a line and say this much is what was inherited and this is what's required now, not least because the um, changing needs for fire and rescue services across Scotland have been happening across that period. And that's a big part of why um, that the level of investment that's required now is needed um, to make sure that buildings are in the right place and equipped for new ways of delivering fire and rescue services um, and to make sure that the vehicles and other equipment are fit for new ways of working. I guess one of the first things looking at the looking at the headline figure is how much of that is critical. You know, you know how the NHS has a, a very comprehensive system of uh, uh, estimating which which buildings are in a critical state, which which maintenance is critical, and so on. Sort of a traffic light system, I guess, in a way. Is there anything similar with the fire services? I'll ask the team to talk you through the, the way in which the estimates um, built up. Um, I think it's important to note, though, that what we're saying is, is not that at the moment this is um, presenting immediate risks to the fire service's ability to provide its services. It's more about thinking about what's required for the future and also providing good fit-for-purpose working conditions for firefighters and other staff, which is obviously very important. Mark, Catherine. Catherine. On the um, the breakdown, we do we did actually during the, the audit look at information about um, the the structure of the capital backlog, but I don't have the detail um, to give you an outline of, of what that breakdown was. But we can certainly um, provide that. And provide us with uh, a, pr a priority, if you like. It categorises the different uh, capital backlog issues. So it's crit it goes from critical to. It's more breakdown by the property fleet and the, the arrangements within that, rather than actually prioritising it specifically. So there's no way of knowing what is actually critical? Because, you know, we're talking about uh, 389 million here. Um, is 10% of that critical? Is 25% of it critical? That, that's, that, that, that is the real issue. I, th I, th I think that that's probably a, a more detailed question um, for the Fire and Rescue Service. They, they have a medium-term asset management strategy in place which sets out um, where they want to um, prioritise their, their efforts. Um, what we've been recommending is that that's updated and that is um, complemented with a longer-term plan for their, their asset management, which would, would take into account that, that degree of prioritisation that was needed. 
If I'm not wrong, or if John, I think you said that uh, current capital uh, current capital expenditure was 32.5? Budget for the current year, I think, it's is 32.5 million, yes. And you've stated that uh, an annual investment of 37.8 over the next 10 years would ensure the assets did not deteriorate. Yep. So they're just a little bit below that in terms of investment? Um, yes, in terms of simply making sure they don't deteriorate, um, but for other reasons to do with the changing risks across Scotland and the challenges of um, recruiting and retaining retained and volunteer fire firefighters, we think they do need to go beyond simply um, stopping the deterioration into investing to make it fit for the future, or they won't be able to um, ensure that services do continue to operate safely and effectively in the longer term. And indeed, in paragraph 55, you expand on that, uh, and you're talking here of three years of investment at 170 million and seven years at 42 million. Yeah. How is that calculated? Those are the figures that come from the financial modelling which the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has already done, which the audit team have tested for reasonableness, and they're linked very much to the vision for transforming services um, to meet um, both the changing needs of Scotland and the challenges they have in, in terms of recruiting and retaining the number of firefighters they need right across the country. Now, you say, you say in the same paragraph, it's unlikely that funding will be available to achieve these options that you're talking about here. Is that simply because of the austerity or? Um, I think what we're doing is looking at the, lo the long-term trends we've seen so far for funding of the Fire and Rescue Service um, and putting that in the context of things like the Scottish Government's fiscal outlook that was published a week or so ago um, and the uh, trend figures that that gives for the likelihood of changing. Um, we have said in here the Fire and Rescue Service needs to continue working with government, but it also needs to be progressing its plans for transforming the services more widely, um, which is likely to require looking again at um, the use it puts its buildings to, um, the scope for sharing with other public services, and uh, changing the way services are delivered in some parts of Scotland. And clearly there are some difficult decisions in there, which is why the Fire and Rescue Service has been so, ke so keen to engage with its stakeholders. Has the Scottish Government accepted the report? Uh, absolutely. We always, um, as, as the committee knows, um, clear our reports for factual accuracy, um, and the, um, that's not something that um, we've changed as a result of that. Mark looks as though he wants to add a little bit of detail to what I'm saying, just to keep this straight. I, I was merely going to endorse what the Auditor General said. Yes, the Scottish Government clear, cleared that number um, with us. And just to be absolutely clear, the £389 million is capital capital expenditure is required. Right. No, no part of it could come from revenue or... Um, I'm it, asking because we don't know the components of that figure. Absolutely, yes. I mean, it is possible under the um, Scottish financial management rules for revenue, um, revenue budgets to be used to invest in capital where that's available. Um, but I think the overall point is that 390 million is a very large amount of money seen against either the long-term trend of capital budgets or the overall capital budget for the service, which I think is about 265 million pounds a year currently. Um, so it's very significant. We think the only way it can be overcome is by taking that long-term view and thinking about how the service can be transformed both to meet the needs of the population, but also to make sure that the capital investment is targeted at the places it will make the most difference. Perhaps I can just briefly ask you about something else. Uh, on Exhibit 1 on page 13, um, I'm looking at uh, the breakdown of the incidents and the total of 56.6% false alarms. Is there any pattern to that? In other words, is, is, is there any... Core, core, core reason, is it, does it come from public buildings, does it come from private residences? It's a startling figure overall, um, and one of the things that the Fire and Rescue Service is trying to do is to understand exactly that pattern better itself, so that it can work with the people who are um, accounting for most of the false alarms um, to reduce it. I think Mark can tell you a bit more about that. Um, just to say that kind of over two thirds of those um, false alarms um, come from non domestic buildings, so the likes of schools and hospitals and, um, for example, care homes. Um, what the fire service has now got in place is a commitment to try and reduce the number by 15% over the next, next three years, and they have a, a strategy for how they're going, going to do that. Um, 
it'll be interesting to mon monitor what progress is made on reducing that, that figure against that target. It, there's also a, a comment here in paragraph 30 about an increase in deliberate fires. Two different um, aspects to this. <coughs> Excuse me. There's uh, the lower grade uh, deliberate fires, which is things like waste bins. Um, they've also got an increasing level of uh, deliberate fires associated with uh, what they what are more primary fires, um, which the statistics show are particularly around uh, vehicle fires. I suppose there's not a great deal the, f the fire services can do to in themselves to reduce that, but presumably they're working with the partners and the police and so on to mitigate that. Yes, the focus of a lot of the preventative work is working with partners, whether it's other blue light services or with uh, councils and other community planning partners, as well as the communities on prevention work around um, tackling um, issues such as deliberate fires. In paragraph 77, one of the um, preventative programmes that the Fire and Rescue Service is working on, um, they have a young firefighters uh, programme where they, they seek to engage with young people, particularly young men, um, to get them involved in the fire service um, with the um, intention and expectation that that may reduce the likelihood of deliberate fires being set. Um, that's clearly a, a good approach to be uh, testing out. Uh, we recommend they should be doing more evaluation of their preventative work, but that they are active in trying to reduce those numbers for very good reasons. Thank you, uh, Willie Coffey. Thank you, uh, Auditor General, in paragraph uh, 48 of the report there, it confirms for the SFRS, confirmed that with the change to its VAT liability, its 2018-19 budget is enough to allow progress with implementing transformation. How, how does that comment then square with what it's got in saying that the backlog problem is insurmountable? Um, that comes back to the uh, running costs of the Fire and Rescue Service, and it's related to Exhibit 4, um, which updates the Committee on the projected funding gap for the Fire and Rescue Service um, over the next 10 years or so. Um, you'll see in there the various projections that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service itself has made for its funding and its costs over that period, and indeed our own assessment of that. Um, and although there's quite a, a wide sort of spread between the lines, the important point about that chart is that the funding gap is very small in, in absolute terms compared to their budget for this organisation. Indeed, in a couple of the scenarios, we're actually looking at a small surplus by 26-27, um, and even in the worst-case scenario, the maximum funding gap um, we're talking about 80 million against a budget of, as I say, about 265. Um, so the uh, revenue costs are now under control, and the Fire and Rescue Service has confirmed that it thinks it can move ahead with the wider transformation that it wants to make. Um, but that is dependent on the ability to invest in, particularly, the property um, and the vehicles and equipment they need to be able to deliver those new ways of working. The, the figures. Um in paragraph 55 again that Colin Beatty mentioned, the £32.5 million pounds capital allocation, that's supplemented by another £4 million pounds in the VAT, the return of the VAT. That comes to 36 and a half. That paragraph says we need about 37.8. So that's hardly, I mean, it's hardly a huge gap to justify calling it insurmountable, I think, is it not? The annual investment of 37.8 is simply to maintain the existing um, plant and uh, property and vehicles and so on um, in a safe condition. Um, but that that um, wouldn't allow the fire service to make the other changes that would both make their revenue costs sustainable and, much more importantly, meet the needs of the people of Scotland across the piece. Um, so it's my judgment that it's likely to be insurmountable without those sorts of changes. Um, but as Mark and I have said, that's not something which has been challenged by um, government or by the Fire and Rescue Service itself. It's a very significant investment that's required. And in terms of arriving at the top figure of the 368 million, has there been any analysis or breakdown? Colin referred to, is there a breakdown of this? Is there a breakdown that, that you based your assessment on? Or have you based your assessment on that top line figure? How do we, you know? Mark? We, we, we on that top line figure and comparing it against the, the trends in capital funding that we had seen, as the Auditor General said, that the likely future um, outlook in terms of, of capital f funding um, and knowing the, the scale of the, the, the change that the, the fire service was envisaging in terms of, of how, how it operated. Um, 
so the, the simple answer to your question was we took that top line figure. Um, as I mentioned, the, the medium term asset management strategy provides more detail that the, that the service has in terms of, of exactly where that would be targeted in the, in the medium term, so over the next three to five years. We don't know. Is, we don't know if there's a, an assessment of elements of that that are essential, desirable that Colin Beatty was alluding to. Do, is it broken down in those terms? Again, I think the see? I think the Fire and Rescue Service would be able to provide you with more more detail of that, as as I said in my response to Mr. Beatty. So. You must have, if you're saying the whole thing's insurmountable. We've got, we've got a copy of the, the the asset management strategy, and that was sort of one of the pieces of the evidence that, that we looked at. The actual kind of the real detail about about where that would be and what the scale of the investment against the, the various elements of it, um, we could provide that, or the Fire and Rescue Service may be able to provide that as well. It's okay. also fair to say that the um, thirty seven. Uh, 0.8 million pound figure over the next 10 years is the figure which is required simply to deal with the, the sort of critical um, maintenance requirements that are likely to come up over that period. Um, the bigger figure is the one that's required to transform um, services, both to make it financially sustainable for the longer term, but also to meet the needs of people across Scotland. Um, the team have tested those figures out in the ways that we've described, um, but they're really the two, um, the two parameters within which investment is required. I think I probably want to see the details of that board report that breaks down the, the figure, I think, to, to give some clarity to the members of the committee, I think. Can we... Thank you. OK. Uh, before we leave this area, if I may, um, can, I think it would be useful if we can make this real to the people of Scotland, if you like. Uh, first of all, we've heard quite a bit about this nearly £400 million pound backlog, maintenance backlog. What does that actually mean? Does that mean <clears throat> fire appliances breaking down? Does that mean fires not being able to be put out to the people? important for us to be clear that it doesn't mean that at the moment, um, that the fire service um, rightly takes a very um, structured approach to maintaining its most important um, equipment and vehicles um, so that people are safe. Things will go wrong from time to time, they're bound to in any service, um, but at the moment we're not seeing um, wide-scale problems because of a lack of maintenance. Um, those, uh, those risks will increase if the uh, lower level of capital investment isn't made over the next 10 years. But more importantly than, than that, I think, um, because of the uh, changing risk to the population, because of the way that we live our lives, um, because of an ageing population, because of the increasing number of severe weather events and the risk of terrorism, um, it'll be harder to respond to those risks. And that difficulty will be increased further because we know already that the um, system of relying on retained firefighters and volunteers, particularly in remote and rural parts of Scotland, isn't sustainable, again, because of changes in the way that people live their lives. So to be able to um, have the right firefighters in place at the right time and to make sure that they have the equipment and the uh, vehicles that they need to be able to work effectively requires a very significant amount of capital backlog and the best the, the best estimate is £389 million pounds that we've used in the report. Catherine, I think they want to add to that. It's, um, it was really just to highlight a point that the Her Majesty's uh, Fire and Rescue Inspectorate uh, plan to um, under, are, are currently actually undertaking an assessment of fleet and will be reporting late, later in this year. Uh, we'll come back to the retained firefighters uh, later. Uh, but that, that sounds concerning. And picking up on a point that Willie Coffey was raising. So we're in a context where I think the government funding, so the Scottish government funding, has decreased by about 12% in the last five years. Uh, I think somewhere in the report you're projecting an 80 million shortfall by 2026. Uh, but, the, but that is set in a context of we have just been told that there needs to be a huge investment, there needs to be a, a transformation is the word I think you used. Uh, I'm struggling to square how those two can marry. I'll try and unpick them for you slightly. Um, the reform of the Fire and Rescue Service um, 
pre-2013 um, was based on a need to uh, make savings in order to be able to make the service financially sustainable in future. Um, the savings which the Fire and Rescue Service has achieved so far are very much in line with the estimated savings at that point, and we think they're on track to continue over the 10-year period after the merger happened. Um, the 20 million figure that you highlight, oh, sorry, the 80 million figure that you mentioned, I think is the um, Fire and Rescue Service's own worst case scenario for their forecast of the funding gap um, over the next 10 years. Um, and their best case scenario is actually a relatively small surplus. Um, so the 80 million is a worst case estimate, but it could well be a small surplus or somewhere in the middle. We think it's likely to be in the middle. Um, beyond that, though, um, their ability to become financially sustainable in that way does depend on the need to invest significant amounts of money in the buildings they work out of, the vehicles they use, and the other specialist equipment. Um, the estimate of that is £389 million. That is very significant. Um, the committee knows that I am careful in the language I use in my reports. I don't use the word insurmountable lightly, um, and I think that's an important conversation for the uh, Fire and Rescue Service uh, to continue having with government and to continue developing its own asset plans um, and investment strategy in the way we've rec recommended in the reports. Uh, and on that transformation then, I, the report identifies that there are some barriers to uh, achieving a transformation. Presumably one of those is whether or not the fire service can get 389 million out of government. Uh, you'll confirm or deny whether that's the case, but uh, what are the barriers to this transformation being achieved then? Um, we summarise those um, in the report, and the team will be able to point me towards them um, in just a moment. Yes, I think we're at paragraph 38, um, which are the things that are um, difficult over and above the need to um, deal with that uh, uh, investment backlog which we've identified. Mark, do you want to talk the committee through those factors? Yes, as, as the Auditor General said in her opening comments, that the um, the, the, pro the process that the fire service has gone through has been, been a very, very cautious one. And what they've been trying to do and the way that they have, have talked about it themselves is, 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 is build a coalition of the willing. So they've been trying to sort of build a consensus among, among staff, among the public, with unions, with politicians, um, about, about the direction of travel for the organisation. And so... Here we are in 2018, five years after merger, and they're, they're now in, in a place where they want to, to start moving ahead with their, their transformation agenda. I think that that cautious approach has meant that it's perhaps um, been, been slightly slower than perhaps anyone might have thought back in 2013, um, but they've been trying to take a very measured approach to it. A second element is um, surrounds the, the nature of the um, environment with the the fire service finds itself in with regards to the fire brigades union which operates at a uk wide level and negotiates at a uk level so with the scottish fire and rescue service trying to um, move into a, into a slight onto a slightly different agenda and a slightly different pace from other parts of, of the uk um, yet the, they've been having to negotiate with the fbu which operates at a uk wide level and and will clearly have, have uk wide interests and position to take um, they were also cautious because, they, as again, as the Auditor General said, they wanted to make sure that the financing, they were confident they were in a place to move, move ahead. And it really was only at the end of last year that they, had, they were sufficiently confident that with additional funding provided by the Scottish Government in the 1819 budget and the decision on um, VAT liability, that they were, they were now in that position. That has been underpinned by, by what we see as very, very good long-term financial planning. Um, Again, as, as we've said, said previously, we recommended that the service produce a long-term financial strategy um, three years ago. They, they, they seized that recommendation and very much took it to heart and progressed it very, very quickly. Um, and they were engaging with us during the course of that process. And I think that's put them in a very positive position for understanding their future cost pressures. Um, and that's allowed them to be now confident about where they're going to go. Thank you. Uh, finally, for me, uh, in terms of that transformation, uh, the report suggests that there's been a loss of continuity of leadership across a number of the integration and transformation projects. Uh, and I noted that two of the four most senior officers are going to retire uh, within the next two years. Uh, so what are the Fire and Rescue Service doing to address that leadership issue and ensure a degree of continuity? 
We talk about the um, workforce challenges a bit later in the report, um, around page 21. Um, and it, it is absolutely clear that um, staff turnover, and particularly the retirement profiles of staff, is a problem in general. Um, we see it in Exhibit 5 with the number of staff throughout the Fire and Rescue Service who are likely reti to retire because of their age. And that's a particular bottleneck around the experienced senior officers um, who are required not just to run the Fire and Rescue Service, but also to lead these complicated um, transformation projects that we've been touching on this morning. Um, now, part of that is due to the current arrangements for pensions, where firefighters who joined before 2006 um, are able to retire after 30 years service at the age of 50 on a full pension. That will change over time. It, it, for firefighters who joined after 2006, we're moving to a normal retirement age of 60 and 40 years of service, but we are currently um, managing through that transition. Um, and secondly, as the committee has noted before, the changes to, to the taxation of pensions at the moment, which mean uh, that the, the incentives for people to carry on working um, are very much reduced for people who have um, built up significant pension pots. And that change uh, keeps on uh, shifting year on year, which I think is um, encouraging uh, some people to take uh, their pensions while they can and move on. Um, so the Fire and Rescue Service has done some good work on workforce planning, which we set out on page 20, but at the moment it's finding it hard to counteract the effect of those pension and tax changes which are currently working through. Um, lots of the work that's doing is about not just understanding the makeup of their workforce, the age makeup and when people are likely to move on, but also looking at how they can develop and train um, up-and-coming firefighters um, to take on those roles more quickly, and of course importantly to increase the diversity of their workforce. At the moment, the Fire and Rescue Service is something like 94% male among its uniformed staff, um, and being able to attract a wider group of um, people from the community, women and people from other um, from minority groups, would also help to, to deal with the sorts of pressures we're talking about. But at the moment, it's a short-term challenge that they will struggle to deal with. Thank you. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Convener. Can I just go back to the, the UK government issue? Uh, the lifetime allowance has been a, a problem across uh, occupations in health service, for example. I think it's just over a million pounds is the current um, limit. Uh, that has caused uh, an acceleration of very senior staff to leave at a much earlier age. Um, this is really out with the control of Fire and Rescue Service, and it's very difficult for me to see an easy solution for very senior staff. Have you any general observations across your remit about the lifetime allowance difficulties? Only to agree with you, I think we have seen um, in policing, in fire and rescue and in the health service, the effects of the reduction in the lifetime allowance and also the introduction of an annual allowance for the amount that can be um, invested in a, a pension scheme, contributed to a pension scheme tax-free each year. Um, and I think it's not, it's not simply the fact that those limits have been introduced by the UK government, it's the lack of predictability about them, that they can change year on year without very much um, foresight of how they're likely to affect an individual that's causing uh, some people who have the option um, to, to take their pensions and, and uh, limit the risk in that way. Um, it is a reserved matter. Um, I don't have a, a role in relation to the UK government, but we are looking closely at the effects um, of people's retirement decisions in the uniform services that we're talking about today um, and also in the NHS where we know it's a significant issue. But what, uh, so you can read it, it was obviously a lot higher even in recent times, if memory serves me right, but it was about 1.5 million, I think, even in just a few years ago. So there's been a dramatic reduction. I mean, that seems a large amount of money, perhaps for people watching this uh, broadcast, uh, but for certainly for a lot of professionals over a lifetime, that's uh, a million isn't actually a huge pension pot if you're at a very senior post. I would agree with you. Um, I think uh, if you look at the, um, the remuneration reports um, for the most senior people in a range of public bodies, they're affected by this simply because of the length of careers people have in the public service. You don't need to be terribly well paid to be affected by the cap where it currently sits. Um, it does also play into the annual allowance, which I think is now £40,000 a year. And again, if you have a large pension pot with contributions going in from the individual, um, the employer and the growth in what you already have, it can tip over that quite easily. Um, and of course, we all recognise that they are large sums of money um, compared to the average earnings of people right across Scotland. Um, and I think that's probably why it hasn't received um, 
um, as much attention so far. Um, we are looking at it in Audit Scotland. It's one of the challenges I think public services are going to have to plan for in making sure they've got the people they need to continue providing high quality public services in the future. And it's one more of the areas where the division of responsibility between the UK government and the, and the Scottish government um, mean that it's difficult to manage. Thank you. I've got some qu questions of workforce management, but take that at a later stage. Can we know if and of course, Willie Coffey, did you want to come back in on something? It was just on the point that you raised yourself on Exhibit 4, uh, the long-term projections, financial projections, and you, you picked out the, the most negative figure that's in the chart there of minus £77 million. Pounds. But I just wanted to clarify with the Auditor-General that the most positive assessment of that is actually a surplus of £44 million pounds in the same chart. So we, we kind of live between the two. I think Audit Scotland's own projection, according to this chart, is about a £400,000 short gap, which is it's nothing like 77 millions of a shortfall. It's, it's kind of almost break-even, is that? Would you just confirm that that's your That's exactly the point assessment. I was making, Mr Coffey. Yes, that there's a wide range there. I think even at the extremes, it's still a relatively small gap compared to a £265 million annual budget, um, and our own assessment is very much in the middle of that. Thanks. Thanks very much. That was all. Thanks. Ian Gray. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, it, it, the report uh, is generally very positive, what our general, as colleagues have said, but in your opening remarks you identified uh, two concerns, or two areas of concern, and one was the, the capital um, requirement, which, which we've explored a bit, but the other was the problems around uh, retained firefighters. Um, and, and you said when you were talking about um, uh, the capital, the inherited capital shortfall, that you uh, are always careful in your language. Um, uh, and I think that's true. But when it comes to uh, retained firefighters, uh, you're, you are actually in the report quite strong in your language again. You say the current RDS model in Scotland is no longer fit for purpose. Uh, and the figures that you give are certainly worrying. So um, uh, an overall availability of 82% uh, and in weekdays as low as 67%. Um, and uh, you also point out that four out of five of Scotland's fire stations re rely wholly or in part on RDS. So this is a very, very significant uh, problem. And finally, you point out that uh, 20 retained firefighters or volunteers are leaving the service every month. So um, this is a problem which would appear to be getting rapidly worse. So I, I, I suppose my question really is, to what extent do you think this is jeopardising the capacity of the service? Or how close is this to jeopardising the capacity of the fire and rescue services to deliver what, what we want them to? I think we say in the report that we think the current model with its reliance on retained firefighters and volunteers is unsustainable in the longer term. Um, that's not an issue which affects only Scotland. It, it, it operates right across Scotland and in, indeed internationally. Um, it is related to, first of all, the fact that we have an ageing population, so there are fewer um, people of an age and fitness who are likely to want to be and to be um, able to be uh, retained firefighters, and also the fact that people who live in remote and rural communities are often having to travel further to their main jobs and are therefore either not available at all to act as retained firefighters um, or are available for less time, and that's what's leading to the sorts of availability patterns you're seeing there. It's absolutely recognised by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, and it's one of the things which underpins their vision for how they want to transform the service for the future. Um, I'll ask Mark if he'd like to tell you a bit more about what we know about the timescale and what they're doing um, to uh, make that transformation happen. So, the, as the Auditor General said, Scotland's not alone in, in having this problem, and the service is, is taking active steps to look globally uh, uh, what other, other countries have, have done in terms of, of trying to re respond to, to this situation. I think the, the message that came to us very clearly was that, was that no one has, has cracked this. There is no simple solution to this. Um, what the service is trying to do as part of its long-term transformation agenda is, is, is revisit and rethink 
um, how it deploys um, both whole-time firefighters and retained firefighters and perhaps have more um, a more mixed model where you have a mix of whole-time firefighters and, and retained duty fire firefighters um, within a single crew. And that could apply both in rural areas and in urban areas. But what they're trying to do is work out how that um, m can best be matched against contemporary risks, both in terms of fire risk and the wider community safety risk that they're trying to expand their role into. Um, so that, that process is very much ongoing and is, is absolutely integral to the um, changing shape and, and role of the organisation in the future. It also, going back to the conversation about capital, it also fits in with the kind of what is the nature of the fleet that they're going to need in the, in the future. Are they going to need smaller, more agile um, vehicles that they can use? And I think they've been trialling that in, in certain parts of the country. Um, Obviously, they will still need traditional appliances in, in, in many cases, but are there other options for the ways that they can crew? So having smaller vehicles, needing smaller numbers of crew, um, still are to the appropriate to the level of risk that they're facing. So as the Auditor General says, this is it's very much part and parcel of the, the transformation agenda as well, is responding to this situation with the um, existing model of the retained duty firefighter and feeding that into the, the what is the what is the role and shape and how the organisation operates in the future. I mean, it, it, it would seem then that we have um, a problem here which is not unique to Scotland, to which no one has an answer, which is worrying. Um, so I suppose I'm trying to get at just how critical a problem is this. Now, four out of five of our 356 fire stations rely at least in part on retained firefighters, but clearly I assume some of those are smaller, less busy fire stations than, um, do, I mean, do we have any sense of, in terms of the activity and the work of the fire service, how much of that is dependent on RDS? We know um, that the problem is most acute in the Highlands and Islands, in the remote and rural parts of Scotland, as you would expect, um, where population is much more thinly spread. Um, fires are, are less likely to happen um, on a regular basis than they do in a, an urban area like Edinburgh. Uh, but nonetheless, when a fire happens, you still need a very strong emergency response to it. Um, they're also affected more by the availability of volunteer and retained firefighters. So the remote parts of Scotland, particularly the Highlands and Islands, are the most affected. Um, they're the areas, I think, where it's least clear what the um, longer-term response should be, um, and that's why the Fire and Rescue Service is, first of all, making sure that it understands where the challenges are, where the um, fire stations are, um, which are finding it most difficult to have the staff they need at the times they need them, um, and then to look at what the options are for responding to that. Um, Mark's talked talk about the trials around rapid response vehicles and other types of equipment that can be safely operated with fewer firefighters. Um, the Fire and Rescue Service is also currently chairing the National Strategic Planning Group that's pulling together the other emergency services to see how they can pull their resources to operate more effectively. But it's transformation on that scale that will be needed, um, not just for reasons of finance, but much more because the risks and our ability to respond to them are changing because of demographic change and things we can't control, like severe weather and terrorist threats. So it sounds like we're really just at the beginning of trying to find a way through this problem. Is there a place in Audit Scotland's programme where you'll be returning to this to, to see what progress there's been? Um, we, we will be monitoring the Fire and Rescue Service's response to the recommendations in this report through the annual audit work that happens every year. Um, and I'm happy to bring an update back to the committee when I think that would be a useful thing to do, either because of good progress or because the problems are accelerating. Uh, Alex Neal. Before I come to my main question, can I go back to the issue of the lifetime allowance on the pension? Uh, because I think this, I, you know, uh, when I was the Cabinet Secretary for Health, this became a major issue. And can I ask um, the work you're doing, which is, I think, across the public sector, looking at the impact of the lifetime allowance on early retirement or early air retirement? Uh, and to get it in perspective, you know, the <coughs> 40 grand a year allow maximum allowance means that anyone who's able to put 40 grand in uh, would only work 25 years and they hit the lifetime allowance cap. It used to be 1.8 million and George Osborne gradually reduced it to a billion. Just one of his mistakes. 
Um, but um, in the health service, my view was it didn't just affect retirement. Uh, when it was reduced to, I think it was 1.25, in Glasgow alone, we suffered a 40% reduction in the availability of doctors for out of our services. So as well as looking at the impact on earlier retirement, and you're looking at the impact, for example, on the fire service, does it disincentivise certain people to, to do additional work? Or, um, you know, certainly in the health service, I think it does. Um, I, I think this is a big issue in public services, actually, at a very, at, at the top level, but there's a lot of vacancies at the top level. Um, you're absolutely right. It doesn't just affect people's decisions about retirement, but the broader decisions about their working lives, whether they're looking to reduce their hours, if that's an option, whether people who have retired come back to act as locum doctors or provide out-of-hours services or whatever it may be. Um, we're not doing audit work directly on the changes, uh, the effects of the uh, taxation of pension, um, but more generally looking at the impact across the workshop, as, the workforce of some of those um, bigger uh, forces like uh, changes to retirement age, changes to pension taxation, public sector pay policy, um, the whole range of things, demographic change, which we know are making it harder for a range of reasons to not just retain the people who are needed now to manage public services, but to um, see that pipeline of people coming through for the future. Um, I know it's a matter that you've expressed interest in over a long period, Mr Neil, and we'd be happy to talk to you about that, but we're currently scoping out what the questions are and what information we'd need to answer them. Do you intend to do a report on this at some stage, Auditor General? Probably more a briefing, I think, for right, okay. lots of these issues are issues which are matters of policy, um, whether UK government policy around pension taxation or pay policy in relation to the Scottish Government, um, but I think that there is a risk that when you bring all of those together, you start to have unintended consequences for our ability to have people at the right level providing vital, vital public services, and I think a briefing on that might be useful to Parliament. I think that would be extremely helpful. I think also, on the back of that briefing, we should ask the Scottish Government to raise this with the Treasury in the run-up to the November budget, because I, I think this is having a very, and it must be not just in Scotland, it must be across the UK, it's having a very detrimental impact. Uh, on the availability of people for senior positions that are absolutely critical to the successful running of public services. I think we, once we, we get that briefing, I think we need to, to take it up. My main question uh, is on the savings. I think it's about £300 billion. Can you give us more details on where those savings are going to be? Why is it £300 million? You know, what, what are the chances of it happening? What are the implications? Um, we can. Do you have a paragraph reference in front of you, Mr Neil? I'm no, I don't no. have the report, the original right. report in front <laughs> okay. of me. Thanks. Um, we will find it and come back to you. Here is it. Uh, yes, p paragraph 46, I think. Oh, oh right, um, oh, right, OK. Yeah. Right, thanks. That's sir. right. Um, we uh, note in the report that the financial memorandum to the bill, um, which established the Fire and Rescue Service, suggested that reform could, re could generate £328 million of savings by 2027-28, so over a long period of time. Um, and we um, note that the Fire and Rescue Service is on track to deliver that. Mark, can you give us a bit more detail about how that's being done? Just, just to add to, the, to, to that, a, a lot of those savings were driven early on by the bringing together of the eight, the eight services and, and some of the efficiencies that were generated during that, that process, which are then recurring over the, the, the next few few years, up to 2026-27. Um, the information that we've had from the Fire and Rescue Service is, is that they're confident they remain on track to, to deliver that service. I guess the attention has now shifted more, more to the what's the necessary investment needed in the future to, um, to realise the transformation that, that's going on. We say in the report that they've made substantial project progress on um, a number of integration um, activities that they've been doing over the last, last few years. For example, they have um, rationalised their control centres um, from eight down, down to, to three. Um, there's, so part of that was a saving, but part of that was also um, improved service provision um, in the longer term. There was standardisation of um, breathing apparatus for, for firefighters as well. And most recently, they've moved, moved to a standardised um, terms and conditions um, for uniform firefighters, which was the really the last sort of element of the, the integration bit of the reform process that was, was going, going on. So all of those things, to greater and lesser extent, have contributed to that £328 million um, savings figure that was projected back when... Um, 
the bill was being considered by the Parliament. Um, most of that was happened early on through that integration process. So if it's happened early on, are you able to check that those savings, when the fire service tells you that they're you know, uh, making progress and they're in line with their budget on the savings, have you double-checked that that's the case? We, we were very content with the information they gave us about that. Right, OK. So what, in the period left, how, how much of that £328 million pounds is still outstanding in terms of savings still to be made? I think you might be challenging my mental arith arithmetic here. Um, I, rather than give the committee an um, inaccurate figure, can I get back to you on, on that? Yeah. Can, could you also tell us how most of those savings are going to be made? You know, is it recurring, is it recurring expenditure that's being reduced? Is it reductions in manpower? Um, is it still dealing with the legacy inefficiencies, inefficiencies and that getting those out of the system? A, a broad overview of that would be very helpful. I mean, the, the, the first point to make is that the, the vast majority of the fire services budget is, is staff. So, so a lot of the um, there were reductions in, in staff numbers in the, the, the early years of the services history. So some of those are, are recurring savings from from reductions in, in work, workforce. Also, greater efficiencies being being built in through through having national services and shared access to national facilities as well is is helping as well. Um, again, the, the the finance was not the sole driver for doing these. It w was trying to improve the service at a national level in terms of what we were doing. As I said, most of these things have kind of happened through in the early years of the service in terms of recurring costs resulting from the merger and then the subsequent integration work that went on. It's very helpful, but it'd be useful to get the balance still to be achieved and, and what's actually still to be saved. We, we, we will write to the committee on that. So. Great, thank you. Uh, supplemental from Bill Bowman on that point. Oh, sorry, it was actually on a, another point I wanted to... Uh, to All right, Do, I'll bring David Stewart in back in just now then and come to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kavita. And could I raise just a couple of issues around workforce planning? Obviously, in any large organisation, workforce planning is absolutely crucial to the success of the organisation. If I can just raise two very quick examples. Uh, a very positive example is the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest policy. So that's where, obviously, firefighters respond with paramedics, uh, which I think is excellent in terms of intervention and join services up. Um, as you know, um, the pilot was a success, but the trial is currently suspended. Um, does the service, uh, is the service clear about the numbers of staff it needs going forward? This is an excellent initiative. Clearly, there's some budget issues. How can this continue? What are the workforce planning issues around this excellent initiative? I think the first thing to say is that this is a good example of some of the challenges that the Fire and Rescue Service, service um, has to respond to in negotiating with the FBU um, at a UK level. Um, as you say, the pilot here in Scotland of the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest service um, was very positive, um, had appeared to have a real impact on people's lives and well-being, um, and was welcomed um, right across Scotland. Um, I think the FPU at a UK level um, decided that they were not yet ready to agree this is a way of working, even though the pilots in Scotland had been successful and the negotiations are continuing as part of that. Um, we talk in the report about the Fire and Rescue Service's vision for changing the role of the firefighter more generally. That's one aspect of that. But they think there is scope for firefighters to um, keep people safe in a range of other ways. And that's very much the negotiation which is underway just now. I'll ask Mark and Catherine to talk you through um, what we know about the uh, detail in relation to the cardiac arrest pilots particularly. The um, point that I'd, I'd like to make more th um, would be around actually uh, that Sorry, Mark, can you pick up on that? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, there's, there's obviously the pilot was very successful, as you said, Mr Stewart, and there will be a kind of... If they are able to progress with this, um, then there'll be a training requirement to, um, to um, support port firefighters in, in how, how this goes on. It's all dependent on, on, on the negotiations with the FBU because the changing role of a firefighter is being negotiated at that UK level. So it's everything's kind of in abeyance until those negotiations are able to progress. Should they be successful and should an agreement be reached to, to move ahead and, and roll out that out-of-hospital cardiac arrest work, there will be, be a training requirement and that will, will have an, an impact. Um, 
on on the, on the service, but at the moment everything is is, is just on hold at the moment. I understand negotiations around the union, and uh, I think that's crucial. But I think the general point um, is that um, clearly having blue light services, uh, first response services to save lives is crucial. I know from experience uh, that some uh, some members of the police force carry defibrillators, for example. They're more likely to, to meet someone in an emergency, and a few seconds can be, can be vital. But can we move on to another, my final area, where there's a bit of a challenge, to say the least, and that's in support staff. Um, there is a real problem, I think, in re recruitment and retention of sports staff, um, 65 and a half full-time equivalent short. And there's particular um, snag areas, um, ICT, for example, 20% uh, under. Um, do, does the service understand uh, the issues around the support and re recruitment of uh, support staff? And I'm particularly concerned in the areas around finance, when clearly you flagged up there's some financial issues, that there's com considerable shortages in finance and procurement staff as well. Any general observations around this? Um, the first thing to say is that um, all those support services often get um, a, a sort of bad rap. They're seen as being an overhead rather than a key part of providing public services. We're very clear that they are key. Um, that includes finance staff and particularly IC ICT staff where lots of the vision for transformation relies on having the right information um, and uh, IT support available to do that. Um, now the uh, workforce planning that the Fire and Rescue Service has done is clear about the staff they think they need to do it. The challenge is in recruiting and retaining those staff for the longer term and making sure that they um, remain engaged and feel that they are a vital part of the service. Mark, do you want to pick up a bit about what they're doing in that area? I, th I think very briefly, I mean, in answer to your question, they are, they are acutely aware of the, the, the scale of the challenge here and, and are not, not alone in this. I mean, we've seen across our, our work, our work um, real challenges in recruitment and retention, in particular of ICT staff for, 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 for public services, and that's, that's a particular risk. And I think it's worth saying that, that yes, although they there are below their target operating model in terms of, of finance staff, and as we've commented in the report, I think that um, financial management is very strong in, in the fire and res rescue service. There are real challenges in the future, and we've discussed the implications of the, the capital backlog, for example. Um, but in, 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 in short, I think they're very, very acutely aware and, and actively seeking ways to try and attract people into the service, and that's part of their ongoing recruitment strategies. Coming down conscious of time. I mean, is there any general issues that you've gained on this? The sort of classic management where there's a problem would be to look at the salary, the environment that people experience, the job design. Is there any issues around there that you're, co you're conscious of? Should there be an Edinburgh Glasgow premium for ICT staff, for example? I don't think we've got into, to be honest, got into that level of detail with them in terms of, of sort of how at the individual job level that they're, they're, they're trying to attract people. That would perhaps be a question that the committee might wish to ask of the service. Okay, thank you, Kinvir. Thank you. Bill Bowen. Can I go back to the capital investment backlog that we spoke about before? And in the conversation here, the term investment and maintenance have sort of been used interchangeably. Are we talking about um, investment in the future that would go onto the balance sheet? Are we talking about maintenance that would go through the expenses? Or what is the makeup of that? Uh, the so-called backlog. Yeah, the 389 million um, is all uh, capital investment that's required. Um, some of it is to bring existing assets up to um, the required standards to continue operating. Um, some is to change them more fundamentally um, in terms of the type of building you're using or where it's located. Um, and some of it is to create entirely new assets like the rapid re response vehicles that would enable um, different staffing models, for example, to operate. So there's a range of things in there, um, but we're, we're confident that it's all um, capital investment rather than being running costs in quite that way. So there is no backlog of maintenance? Um, there is a, a backlog of uh, maintenance required to bring them up to the standard that's required to be fit for purpose, as we say in the report. So when this investment comes about, will there be any cost by retiring assets that are um, currently in the books? The um, 389 million figure is an estimate, but it's the best estimate of the net cost of doing it. Clearly, there is scope to. Um, so that's the net cost. You mean in terms of what would go through the income statement? No, I mean um, the the net investment required less things like capital receipts where they would be available. And would those receipts be more or less than what the relevant assets are in the financial statements at, which would then go through the income statement? 
at this stage, we're all we're talking about estimates on all of it, and um, lots of the estimates are contingent on decisions about whether assets need to be replaced or relocated or indeed um, provided in a different way altogether. They're the fire and rescue service's best estimates based on its vision for transforming the service. It seems from the conversation that we've, you know, this is the, if you like, the big number here. Um, we've all been asking questions, and in the answers, as I sort of understand them, are that this is the number from the system. We've looked at the output from the system and checked that it's producing what we would expect, but we don't really have an understanding of what the number means over you know, what is critical, what is not critical, and some of the things we've, I've just asked you about there. I'll ask Mark in a moment to tell you a little more about the audit work that we've done on the estimate, which is there, because I think that's at the heart of your figure. That work, it's more what it means in terms yeah. of the number, you know, 389, because you, you've referred us to either, you know, to ask the fire and rescue service themselves mm -hmm. what it means. And, you know, if we have to do that, then I think we have to do that. But if you haven't done that... Mark, please. Well, as, as I said, what we'll, we'll do is, is we'll, we'll provide the committee with, with um, the information that we have from the fire service um, in terms of, of, of its asset management strategy, which sets out what it wants to do. We, we looked at that. We considered it, it to be a reasonable estimate and a reasonable approach to, to planning what it was going to have to do, it, do in the future. Um, we didn't get into the detail of looking at... Um, particularities about either fleet or, or estates. Fleets, because we knew that um, our colleagues in HMFSI were going to be doing that during the course of, of this year. Um, nor did we get into, at the level of, of, of this audit, a kind of detailed review of um, assessments of, of condition of estate and, and that sort of thing. We, looked at, we examined it at a fairly high level, it is fair to say. But we will be able to provide you with more breakdown. That would be useful as long as it's not just a pile of information, it's an interpretation. Yes. Okay. Just one other thing, just on um, on wording, because we're speaking about wording. In your summary in item three in the first bullet, you say the SFRS have taken a cautious approach with the aim of securing and maintaining political staff, trade unions and public backing for its vision. Can you just confirm that the SFRS have not really been getting into taking political stances and getting involved in politics? No, I think we recognise that um, for good reason the Fire and Rescue Service needs to change quite significantly over the years ahead, both to meet changing needs of the population and because the, the, the way it's been operating um, since its establishment in the late 1940s um, isn't sustainable because of changes in um, the availability of retained and volunteer firefighters. We know from experience, and the committee knows better than we do, that those sorts of changes are often... Um, sensitive and can be contentious with local communities and with politicians at local and national level. Um, and I think the approach they've taken has rightly been to seek to, to gain backing to the changes they're doing. The judgment that we're making is whether that's been done fast enough. Um, I think it has been steady but slow so far um, and that they now need to pick up the pace of that change given the challenges they're facing around both staffing the service and the costs of bringing its assets up to the condition that's required for the future. So it has been one of informing but not taking a political position? Well, it's a difficult distinction to make, I think, that they clearly have to um, work within the uh, framework set by the Scottish Government's uh, framework for fire and rescue services, which encourages them to innovate. They have to operate within both their understanding of the risks facing the population and the money they're likely to have to spend over the years ahead, um, and that will require them to make changes. Um, I don't think that's uh, political in any party political sense, but it obviously is political in the sense of choices about the way that um, resources are used, public money is used. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, unless there are any further questions from the panel, I would like to thank the Auditor General and colleagues for your evidence this morning and bring this particular evidence session to a close. Thank you. Uh, I'll just allow a little time for the Auditor General and colleagues to leave the table before we move on to our next item.
<coughs> Moving on to item four on our agenda, this is consideration of petition PE1676. Uh, petition PE1676 from Tony Rosser calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review the Land Registration etc. Scotland Act of 2012. As members are aware, the Committee has previously shortlisted the 2012 Act as one of the Acts it will consider as part of its post-legislative scrutiny work programme. The Public Petitions Committee has referred the petition to this committee on that basis. Members will also recall that for each of our shortlisted acts, the committee has agreed to hear further from the stakeholders who suggested the act before agreeing its approach to the post-legislative scrutiny. This will give the committee an opportunity to explore the concerns in more detail and gain an understanding of the issues and generally help inform the committee's approach. So the committee is invited to consider whether it wishes to include the issues raised in this particular permission, uh, petition when agreeing its approach to post-legislative scrutiny of the Land Registration Scotland Act 2012. Are members agreed? Yeah. Thank you. I now close the public part of this meeting and we move into private session.